Almighty God, you who has shown us the way, we pray that we would walk therein, that we would follow after you. Guide us when our affections are torn between you and this world to always follow after you, recognizing that your way leads to eternal life and freedom. We ask all these things in the name of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Y'all can hear me in this, right? Can, can you all in the back hear me? Turn it up a little bit. Yeah, I'm on. Oh, great. I don't have it. <laughs> I'll just talk louder. That's good? All right. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit louder, and we should be good to go. So, today I want to talk about being torn between two empires for our study in Revelation. And so our text is coming from Revelation chapter 2. We are dealing with the message to the church in Pergamum. And I want you to know that this is the third church facing difficulty. So the first two churches that we talked about that were facing difficulty were Smyrna and Philadelphia. And now we are to the third and final church that we will discuss that was facing persecution or oppression from the outside world. I say this and I reiterate it to point out, while many people say that the book, in, a book, the book of Revelation highlights the persecution of the church that is widespread, that is not the case based on the text of scripture. Based on the scriptures themselves, only three of the seven churches face persecution. That's vitally important for us to remember as we look at and analyze where we fall and where we sit within the realm of reading the book of Revelation. So we have Smyrna, we have Philadelphia, and now we are at Pergamum. So I want to read this passage. It says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. As we stop and look at the church and its situation, what we will immediately find is that the city served as a local seat of the proconsul. Now, the proconsul was empowered by the emperor to rule over the region. This was an official who had the ability not only to judge, but this individual had the ability to execute those he found guilty. And usually, this was with the sword. In other words, he, he had the, what was called the power of the sword behind him in everything that he did and said. He maintained ultimate authority in the area, and the only person who answered, who that person answered to really was the emperor himself. So in the midst of this city, you have a church that is facing an individual who has the power to strike them down and kill them. How do you then, as the church, live amid the potential of persecution and even death simply for holding to the faith of Jesus Christ? So in this message, we find that Christ appears with a sword. This is, this is not a coincidence that we see Jesus appearing to the church 
that is located where the seat of the proconsul is with a sword. In other words, while the proconsul might have the authority to judge and exercise judgment, Christ comes with a sword, noting that he has power to judge and exercise judgment, and he maintains ultimate authority over all creation. It's also uniquely important to note that this sword is the only weapon that appears in the first vision of the apocalypse. I think that when we see this as the only weapon that appears, and it's in the hand of Christ himself, well, actually, it, it comes from the mouth, rather, of Christ himself, it should guide us as the people of God to resist our immediate human reaction to take up arms in defense of our faith, as we see what happens here is that Christ fights the battle for his people. The next thing we see in this passage is that Satan has a throne. Yes, Satan has a throne. And his throne highlights a power in opposition to the kingdom of God. I want you to remember for a moment that in chapter 1, at the very beginning, when, when John is giving greetings, he says grace and peace from the one who was and is and is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So we see that God has a throne and we now see that his throne is not the only throne in the picture, but Satan also has a throne. Now this should guide us in recognizing something. Satan's throne Though powerful, though having the ability to strike down and kill believers, does not triumph over the church, does not triumph over the throne of God or his kingdom. But Satan's throne operates through worldly empires in Revelation and throughout history. John's vision of the unveiling of what is going on behind the scenes of the natural world highlight the empowerment of the worldly kingdom by Satan. To give a little bit of background to this, I'm going to turn in the Bible to Revelation chapter 13. It's the famous passage about the beast. And just as a side note, it should be the famous passage about the beasts of Revelation because there are actually two. And they both really make a debut right here. But after Satan, the great dragon, is cast down, at the end of chapter 12 it says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Chapter 13, verse 1 says, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. We have to recognize everyone, generally speaking, would acknowledge that this dragon is the devil. If not, back up in chapter 12, and it actually gives great details about this dragon, who he is, and that we recognize this is Satan himself. And all of a sudden, in verse 2 of chapter 13, we see that the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority to the first beast. Now, I want to make sure that I remind everybody, within apocalyptic literature, generally speaking, beasts are evil rulers who oppress and come against the people of God. And so, we have Satan's throne. It's operating through worldly empires. In this case, I would say operating through the Roman Empire. But that doesn't mean that the same principle does not apply to, the, to us today. So then, you know, we're a good Christian people. Why not just vote the evil out? 
because it's not that easy, folks. We can't just vote the evil out. What we find is that, especially within this message, if you read through it very carefully, the church exercises no power whatsoever. All they can do is they hold on to Jesus' name. We even see in verse 13, there was a man named Antipas who dies. Likely, notice he's a faithful witness, the same way Christ, who died at the hands of the government, was a faithful witness. And so we see this connection between Antipas and his death. And it seems that he might have been a victim of the government's power and of the evil empire. Now we also find this, this issue going on. Actually, I'm going to back up for just a second. Because while we're talking about voting the powers, the evil empire out, the voting evil out, what we also have to recognize is that in chapter 16, Verse 10, we have another encounter with the throne of Satan, which is the throne of the beast, and it's God's judgment. In verse 10, it says, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. But check this out. Amidst all of this, they did not repent of their deeds. We can be stubborn little creatures at times. They did not repent of their deeds. And so all of a sudden, we're seeing these types of things take place. And so what's the big deal about not repenting of their deeds? Because we have individuals who are holding to false teachings. Not all in the church are holding to Jesus' name, sadly enough. Some of them are holding to false teaching. Now, remember, you need to be familiar with the Old Testament to have a better understanding of what's going on in the New Testament, especially the book of Revelation. So while I just mentioned some beasts with seven heads and ten horns, and yes, that does parallel Daniel in, in many, many ways, that's not where we're going today. Because there's another parallel that's vitally important for us to understand. When we see people holding to false teachings, he first notes, you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. This story appears in the book of Numbers. And it's way too long for us to actually cover the entire story because it's multiple chapters, but I'm going to give you the quick summary version, okay? Okay. I want you to go back and read the Numbers chapters 22 through 24 when you get home later on. But in this story, we have the people of Israel, after they have crossed over the Jordan, they have defeated the Amorites, and now the Moabites have heard about it, and they are afraid. So what do we do? A lot of the things, people will automatically say that when you stop and look at the story of the exodus that as God brought plagues upon the, the, the people of Egypt that he was also coming against the gods of Egypt and so recognizing this and recognizing this worldview Balak their prince decides I'm gonna hire someone to pronounce curses on the people of Israel you think yeah this will work and now Balaam, we aren't even going to go into that because that's some really weird stuff. Like, he's not of the people of God, but he functions prophetically, but he is weird. I'm just like, it is weird. But somehow, this person from outside of Israel, who has been paid to basically prophesy against the people of God, hears from God and ends up pronouncing blessings upon these individuals. So as we stop and consider this, after about the third time of him going and attempting to pronounce curses upon Israel and he's pronouncing blessings upon them instead, 
He's like, um, I hired you to curse these people. And every time you go to curse them, you bless them. This is not working out. I mean, if, if, if there's ever a moment to want to speak to the manager or like file a complaint, this is that moment. But oddly enough, there seems to be some, and we don't have the full details of the exchange between Balaam and Balak, but Numbers chapter 25, after this whole encounter, and Balaam leaves, Numbers 25 explains that Israel then defi defiled themselves by committing sexual immorality and engaged, wait, let me back up. They committed sexual immorality with Moabite women and they engaged in idolatry by eating their offerings and bowing down and worshiping their idols. Huh. Let's see. And the people in this church, in Pergamum, have basically done the same thing. They have eaten food, sacrificed to idols, and practiced sexual immorality. So as we stop and look, there are great parallels here. Now, if we want a greater understanding of what this entire plan was, because think about it it wasn't possible to curse the people of Israel while they were being faithful to God. And so all of a sudden it becomes, wait a minute, since we can't curse them and they automatically beat up the Amorites and they'll probably beat us up too if this actually goes on, the next best thing is maybe we can get a curse upon them if they actually don't abide by the covenant they made with their God. And so then they send out the women, and it's like, hey, sexual immorality. We're violating the commandments of God. Oh, wait. Idolatry. Let's violate the commandments of God. And this actually enables the people to now basically end up receiving a curse. And this is what leads to their downfall in their interaction with the Moabites. Now, oddly enough, We're at this location of the proconsul who bears the power of the sword. Jesus shows up and he has a sword that comes from his mouth. The book of Numbers explains to us what happens to Balaam. So if we stop and consider for a moment, these people have already heard, this is what's going to happen to you. And what's going to happen is the same thing that happened to the person whose teachings they would be following. Numbers chapter 31 and verse 8 says, They kill the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain, Evi, Rechem, Zer, Hur, and Reba, and five kings, the five kings of Midian. And they also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword. The book of Joshua also gives an account of this killing that occurred by the sword. So we see that there's a lot of Old Testament recall within this passage that we need in order to fully understand it, or I wouldn't even say fully, more fully understand it. And then we have this whole issue of those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So the Nicolaitans have shown up again. Who they are beats me. Nobody knows, and I don't think we're going to figure that one out until we get to ask John or Jesus or somebody who was there at the time. Any questions so far? Okay, help me on, on, on a scale of like clear to mud, where are we? Clear? Okay. Okay. So let's look at this whole topic of idolatry and sexual immorality. So we, we know that they were associated with the teaching of Balaam, but they are also associated with the world and with the worldly empire. So we see in Revelation 2.14 the declaration that's been made, but now 
We also see in Revelation chapter 9, I don't know why I keep closing my Bible, because I keep opening it right back up. In Revelation 9, beginning in verse 20, this is after the sixth seal, no, sorry, the sixth trumpet has been blown. And it says, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works, yeah, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Now, a lot of times we'll say, well, I'm not engaged in idolatry. I'm a good Christian. I'm good to go. Great. But now here's the question. Do we have things in our lives that we actually do worship, but we don't realize it? This is something we must always consider. I will not forget reading this, and then I later heard it. A failure to keep any commandment is ultimately a failure to uphold and keep the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. Worship no God except me. And somehow, if I am breaking or violating any other commandment, at some point I'm allowing something else, even if briefly, to be more important to me than what God is to me. And so now I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination we're all in trouble and we're, like, I, I just preached saying that we are assured of our salvation because the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. So that's not where I'm going with this. But what I am saying is that we need to be aware that sometimes we can be more worldly than what we think we are and not realize it because we're not looking at things through the lens of Scripture. And here's what happens. God brings destruction on the empire that's engaged in sexual immorality. He brings destruction upon those in the church as well who are engaged in sexual immorality and idolatry. In Revelation 21, 8, and I don't know, this sounds really bad of me, but when I was a little kid, I always heard a song, and it was Revelation, Revelation 21, 8, 21, 8, liars go to hell, liars go to hell, burn, burn, burn. <laughs> what? You, wait, none of you heard this song as a kid? I'm like, okay, so, so I know some of y'all had to have heard this song. <laughs> well, that's because it's talking about hell and burning, but that's another issue. <laughs> But, and yeah, sadly, I did sing that song as a kid growing up. It was really bad, I will admit. But in Revelation 21, 8, it says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. Remember, Jesus declares, hey, if you don't repent of all these things, I will come and wage war with you with the sword of my mouth. He issues this promise. But he also issues another promise at the very end of this text. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. God preserved his people by giving them manna in the wilderness. And I'm going to say something really off and it's weird, but it's just the fact of nature. Manna is a Hebrew word, and we just say manna because literally manna means what is it? It's like, it's this stuff, it looks like coriander seeds, and it's like, but literally the term manna means, what is it? And that's what God fed them with. So God makes a promise to preserve his people and provide for them. But then he also points out 
that he will give them a white stone. And oftentimes, historically, when you were being judged, a white stone would declare your innocence, while a black stone would declare your guilt. And so for those who have now been found guilty before the proconsul, Christ says, I will give you a white stone because you are innocent before me. You are innocent before my father. And therefore, you are welcome into my kingdom. But he, he adds this nice little note and he says that it's a stone with a new name written on it that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, oddly enough, when Jesus comes and he's waging war, there's a great question that people ask. In Revelation 13, as the peoples of the world are now worshiping the beast, I'm going to back up to verse 13 just to give a little bit of context. It, this is the second beast of Revelation. So the first beast that we saw came from the sea, right? The second beast of Revelation comes from out of the land. And the job of the second beast is to have all the peoples worship the first beast. We still clear? So two beasts, first beast from out of the sea, second beast from out of the land. The job of the second beast is to make everybody worship the first. And so it, the second beast, in verse 12, exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven in front of the people. Remember now, this is a false presentation of power. It's, it's actual power, but it's of an evil nature. Remember, the two prophets that were in chapter, chapters 11, moving into chapter 12, were actually able to call fire down from heaven. Now we have a beast who stands in opposition to God, who's doing the same types of works. But notice, it makes fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people, and by the signs that it was allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth. Remember the earth dwellers we talked about last week? Those who dwell on the earth? These people are being deceived by the second beast and telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the, be the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image to be slain. Remember, we're dealing with the church that is facing the power of the sword if they hold fast to the name of Christ. Maybe this is why in verse 10 of this exact same chapter it says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. This message should guide us in how we understand and live within our context. Yes. Hmm? Yes. So there's a, fir there's a first beast, which is in chapter 13 in the first part. The second beast, which is in the second part, the dragon is actually Satan. And so the dragon is not counted as one of the beasts. So the question was, I thought that the, the, the dragon was a beast. So no, the, the dragon is Satan himself, and, and then Satan empowers the first beast, and then through that, the second beast is empowered. Now, let me give you a little bit of historical context for this. Because I've mentioned a few times the imperial cult. So, the second beast that has the power of the first beast, likely, within its historical context, would have been a leader of the imperial cult to force people to actually worship the emperor. If you do not worship the emperor, 
you die. Heads will roll, as they said in movies back in the 80s and 90s. And when we look at this, as we talked about the millennial reign of the saints, <laughs> whatever we want to do with that as far as time is concerned, that's up to you. But within that framework, we see that these people lost their lives because they did not worship the beast and they did not take the mark of the beast. And so it seems that they were found guilty. They were executed for their guilt in the eyes of the government. And Christ raises them up and gives them power. And all of a sudden, the very empire that struck them down and killed them is brought down by the hand of God as those who are faithful to Christ rise up and follow him in overcoming the beast and the beastly empire associated with it. Any questions or thoughts on that so far? Yes. Mm -hmm. I can't think of another place in scripture where fire from heaven is not authentically coming from God because Elijah was Pentecost. Right. What, what's going on there? I mean, Honestly, it seems like there's a counterfeit miracle taking place. Yeah. I mean, because we, we, we see all of these things. So remember, actually, this is a great, great question. If you remember in the story of the Exodus, you have Moses at work, and the hand of God comes out, and Moses performs a miracle, and Pharaoh's magicians perform the exact same miracle. And then it happens again, and it happens again, and it happens again, and it happens again, and then all of a sudden, about the fourth plague upon the Egyptians, there's a great statement, and it ties in with the statement that Jesus makes in Luke's gospel, where Jesus says, if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons... And the kingdom of God is in your midst. Pharaoh's magicians state when they cannot replicate the miracle, this is the finger of God. So there's an extent to which we can see that the powers of darkness do replicate things that take place. And in some ways you might say that since the dragon fell from the sky and was seen as a sign in heaven, that there's the ability for that replication from heaven to even take place still. I like that question. Thank you. Was that another hand or just a, okay. <laughs> Any other questions at the moment? So here's what we must figure out along the way. When we stop and we look at everything that takes place and we see that there's a stone that is given that has a name on it that no one knows except the one who receives it. Then we see an interesting little image in Revelation 19. Because, wait, before we go there, I actually didn't say what I was going to say in Revelation 13, sorry. In Revelation 13, there's a question that's raised where they ask in verse 14. Nope, it's not verse 14. I've lost it. Back up. Verse 4, sorry. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can wage war against it? Who is like the beast, and who can wage war against it? Well, John gives the answer to that question, too. Because in chapter 19, we see that Jesus can. He says in verse 11 of chapter 19, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. So it's like, you know. The beast might have had some crowns. No, Jesus has many diadems on his head. 
and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So when we stop and consider everything that's going on, notice something. The people of God have not taken up arms against their government. The people of God have simply held fast to Christ's name and made every attempt to live as godly people who are following biblical principles amidst a government that is attempting to oppress them. Not only attempting to oppress them, but killing them. And all of a sudden, it leaves us with this one issue. The church that was in Pergamum faced a dilemma. Will you stand before a sword? Yes, absolutely. But the question they had to answer for themselves was, whose sword will you experience? Will you experience the sword of the proconsul and suffer physical death here in this life, only to be raised to life eternal? Or would you avoid the sword of the proconsul only to face the sword of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and face eternal death? May God help us in following him. Amen. Are there any questions, thoughts, concerns, critiques, criticisms, or snide remarks today? Yes, ma'am. As far as the, how would Christians in the Roman Empire would have looked at this after Christianity became a legal religion? Oh, that's a great question. It's amazing how our circumstances change when we, as the people of God, come to power within the worldly empire. One of, one of the things that I often say is, take this with a grain of salt. Oh, I'm not even going to say that. We're in church. <laughs> how do I put this? The marriage and wedding of the church and worldly empire produces sick, weakly, demonic offspring. In other words, what we see happening within history, and, and Wainwright does a beautiful work with this, where he talks about the shifts in views of the church regarding Rome. Before Christianity was legalized, everybody within the church recognized that this was Rome, and that Rome would fall. Then all of a sudden, when we see the rise of Constantine, and well, Christians, they don't have it so bad, even though some were still at the margins. All of a sudden, well, well wait, maybe we need to reinterpret this. Maybe we, we need to reinterpret the millennium. May, maybe Christ has come to us in Constantine. And I'm like, no! That's not what happens at all. But what happened, though, was all of a sudden, the church got into bed with the empire because now the church is in power. And what the church, no matter what time in history it is, has to do is make sure that we are not simply getting into bed with worldly empires because we are satisfied in the moment. I want to remind you of something. Only three of the seven churches faced persecution. That means that the other churches were doing just fine. And Christ comes against them and has things to say about them that if they don't get their act together they're going to be in trouble too. So yeah, there was a shift in our understanding within the early church regarding what's going on with Rome, but that didn't happen until the fourth century, and we see what happened. I mean, the church became highly politicized, the church became corrupt, 
the church basically became a puppet of worldly empires for a good season there. And that's what led to, well, for anyone who came from a Roman background, this is not meant as an offense in any way. But we recognize that the Bishop of Rome had no jurisdiction in any realm beyond his own during the Reformation. That's how we came to the formation of the Anglican Church, is if the Bishop of Rome did not have universal jurisdiction, how did he ever obtain it? It was only through marriage to worldly empire. And so we must, we must be careful of that. Even, even in, in our own context as good Anglicans today, we must be very, very careful that we do not marry ourselves to any governments simply because we might find comfort at, in them in the moment. Yes, ma'am. Henry VIII did not have jurisdiction to form his own church. You are very correct in that. I would say that what Henry actually did, though, was he stated something that was very true early on. We had bishops that affirmed the Nicene Creed as, er, in the fourth century. And so because of that, he didn't actually form his own church. What happened was that the church in England, which had existed for many, many centuries prior to Henry's birth, actually declared, wait, we're not doing this the right way. Now, will I stand here and say that everything was pure in his motives regarding that? Absolutely not. I'm not going to go there. But what I will say is that from an ecclesial perspective, what he noted was true. And while he was there, there went back and forth this whole issue of the relationship between, you know, the see of Canterbury and the, and, and the crown, we must admit that there were already bishops in England who were still administering the church faithfully within the historic threefold order of ministry. Yes, sir. Which, for, for, for better or for worse, so yeah, after the, after the development of the printing press, there were a lot of things that sprang up in new brands of Christianity, and honestly, having the Bible in the hands of the people is a great thing. Having the Bible in the hands of people who do not know how to interpret it is a bad thing. And I think that that's part of where we ended up with all the splits and formations and things that we have today, right. which is why we... Mm -hmm. Right, and that's been the great benefit is that people have come to know Christ because of that. Yeah, no, it's, it's been beautiful. Any final questions before I let you go? I'm going to say have a blessed week and you all enjoy your holiday. <laughs>